Hello there, my name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. First of all, let me apologise for my croaky voice as I've got a chest infection. Waiting for it to clear up, unfortunately, it would have meant missing out on a podcast, which I most certainly don't want to be doing. Gravel pits, many of which become coarse fisheries, are initially created by the commercial extraction of aggregates for the construction industry, with anglers little more than unintended beneficiaries. Many also ultimately become unintended coarse specimen waters too. As they mature, they can develop into some of the very best producers of big carp, bream and tench anywhere in the country. To better appreciate why this should be and how best to fish them, I have with me coarse specimen hunter Mike Winrow, a native Lancastrian now living back up here in the northwest after spending the best part of 25 years away at Hoddleston in Hertfordshire, where he enjoyed excellent access to some of the very best gravel pit fishing in the country. I won't go into too much detail at this stage regarding your own personal catches. Suffice to say, your CV boasts numerous bream and tench well into double figures, more of which later. Let's start by talking about the gravel pits themselves. Well, I think there's two aspects to gravel pits, actually. There's one is like the more recent digging out of them, which seems to be post-war for the aggregates industry, for the road building, like the motorway network, and presumably making concrete and whatever they do with the stuff they dig out. And then there's actually how the materials kind of got there in the first place, which seems quite interesting to me in that it seems a lot of it's down to the ice ages, because it looks like a lot of gravel pits are they're often on the northern side of rivers and what they probably are is where the original course of a river and it obviously depends on the terrain that the river has flowed over essentially you've got your riverbed and then the ice ages have kind of pushed rivers south leaving the gravel and whatever from the original course close by off the right next to rivers But that's left high and dry. And then, say, after the war, maybe doing it before the war, but certainly after the war, suddenly you've had this whole industry has developed for digging them out. So that's kind of how they formed. And it seems that there's many river valleys, like it's not all of them, like certainly in the north, for whatever reason, no, it doesn't seem to occur, even though I know there's a couple of gravel pits on the Ribble, for example, and like the Ribble runs over a lot of sandstone in its lower reaches. So you do get them there, but they do seem to be more concentrated in the south. Certainly the Thames Valley has a lot, but most of southern rivers seem to have them. I know the Trent Valley's got them, Wensum in Norfolk, sort of a lot of gravel pits there, the Lee, and you even get the odd one left high and dry almost. I know there's a whole hundred plus gravel pits around Sirencester in Gloucestershire, and what on earth river might have been there? Who's to say? Whether the Bristol Avon was once there and it got pushed further south, I don't know. But it's kind of an interesting backdrop to them. But as I say, after the war, that was when they were dug out and, um, yeah. So that's how the pits themselves are formed. But what about the water? How does that get in and, as importantly, maintain its level? I think it's often just loosely packed. It'll be the groundwater coming in. Often they have to pump them out while they're being excavated anyway. Often you've got proximity to rivers. Sometimes they can be really next to them, in which you will get coming through there. But there just seem to be natural holes in the ground that fill up with water, if you see what I mean. They obviously get the balance quite quickly. People aren't pumping water in in the first place to fill them up, and rain will take a long time. So I'm sure it's mostly groundwater, and then they get the balance quite quickly. But uh, yeah... They can leak away quite quickly. If you're next to a river, I've, I've known the level of them drop quite significantly over a season, two or three feet or something like that, because it must be quite loosely compacted. But they fill up quite naturally, and yeah, they're always having to pump them out. When an extraction working is initially abandoned and allowed to fill, at that stage it's still just a water-filled hole, open to a wide variety of potential recreational uses. What is it then that makes them potentially so productive in terms of invertebrates for feeding fish, and in specimen fish terms, ultimately the ideal home? I think one thing, certainly the ones in the south, they often have a high pH value, which sort of promotes weed growth and invertebrates and things like that. Obviously the virgin fisheries, 
So often any fish that gets in them, the first ones often will grow big on the water anyway. But they're not just holes in the ground in many ways. From the excavating, they obviously find seams of gravel where they do really well, and others where they don't do so well. So you get spoil heaps and things like that. So you'll get, some pits can be really open, whereas others can have lots and lots of islands on them. And so you'll get like the margins around the islands. And then you've also got the ones that the underwater islands are tiny islands, but you've kind of got the bars and things like that. So a normal, typical big lake might have some very deep water, but most gravel pits aren't that deep. You're getting to the teens of feet quite regularly, but you can also get ones that are really quite shallow. So they can be very rich. And you've not just got the margin round the outside, you've also got lots of other places where silt and whatever can form and get attracted and so then you get the invertebrates there and so on and so forth because the big they're often exposed to the wind and the rain and the sun or whatever that must help as well you don't get the the leaf litter off trees because the trees aren't mature and things like that but yeah it's just a combination of things basically invertebrates usually gain access to a new water quite rapidly and reproduce very quickly indeed fish are a different matter so how do they gain access Given time, and of course the opportunity, will they invade naturally too, or are they deliberately introduced? Probably a bit of both, actually. A lot of the the aggregates companies, well actually by the end, I think there might have been quite a few, but, but by the end there was only really two of them, that sort of the, the sort of like the big conglomerates now, like one of them, Ready Mix Concrete, RMC, that's actually been taken over by a French company called CMEX. And then there was Redlands Aggregates as well. But actually they add subsidiaries to sort of, because often as a part of the condition of being digging out the pit in the first place, they had to restore it back to public use. And so a lot of them, you might get sailing clubs on there as well. Some of the smaller pits would just become fishing. Sometimes they had to fill them back in, but obviously if they had angling subsidiaries, they would stock them with whatever they felt necessary. Obviously, because the next two rivers, you can get flooding into them. I, I know one pit which... It got stuck with crayfish that just came off the river stored, in fact, and just through flooding in there. That's the only way they would have done it. The larvae would have got in there so you could get fry fairly easily as well. And, as I say, it might be just some charitable soul chucking a couple of fish in. I, I remember actually once, one of the complex of pits I fished, one of the conditions of digging this particular pit was to actually revert it back to just the normal field at the end. And just before they did it, I... Once he'd finished the work, I had a bit of a walk along it, around it, and I saw the biggest shoal of fry I've ever seen in my life. It must have been 50, 60, 70 yards long. And presumably what had happened, somebody had chucked a couple of fish in, probably chub or something like that, from the neighbouring river stort. They'd bred, and because there was no predators in the water, all these tens of thousands of eggs had all produced little tiny fish. So if they do get the fish in there... They will breed quickly. There won't be the predators to mop them up. And so, yes, they can get fishing quite quickly. Albeit, though, from my experience, they always seem incredibly understocked for the amount of food that's in there. It's absolutely amazing. You kind of think they mustn't breed properly in there because you, th- you expect them to be absolutely loaded with small and medium fish, whereas, in fact, they, they tend to produce the very biggest fish and often not in great numbers. Sometimes it can produce big numbers and big catches just because of the size of them but it's a kind of a funny sort of thing but yeah the original fish from angling schemes and so on part of the condition and as i say flooding and people putting fish in and they'll, they'll soon get going anyway where a lake is big enough particularly if there's a commitment for its use as a shared activity resource do you see much in the way of negative interaction or even hostility between sailors anglers bird watchers and the like or does it not affect the fishing much, really? And, of course, vice versa. I don't think it probably affects the fishing. Anglers certainly won't be bothered with bird watches. Bird watches maybe have a different sort of thoughts on angling. Sailing, the one thing you've got to watch out for is if they come close to the shore and they catch a tackle or even your rods or something worse than that. But normally, common sense prevails and you get no fishing areas in the areas of where you've got the sailing clubs and they have boys out in the lakes and things where they won't come closer to the side and obviously some pits aren't suitable at all because like the ones with lots of islands no you're not going to be sailing there it's going to be where you've got more of a an open body so i don't think there's much conflict or whatever you tend to get some pits which are just sailing only 
and some that are fishing. You, you, there's not that many which are a combination of them. There's just in any one locality you'll get one or two sailing clubs because it's not a, a wide spread sort of thing. So they they choose the two biggest best lakes in the area and that's what they sail on and you may or may not be able to fish them. You mentioned earlier elevated pH levels and exposure both to wind and sunshine. In water quality and habitat terms, what else is there that conspires to make gravel pits potential specimen fish havens? Well, I think they're amazingly rich. They tend to be clear, even ones that are noted for carp. They have very rich weed growth, which I'm sure that helps to filter out any sort of colour and the invertebrates you get in the weed can be absolutely amazing. If you drag it out of the side with a rake and it is absolutely stuffed with the little water beetle type things, whatever they are, and you think about the size of the lake and there must be a huge biomass of invertebrates. It, it may be one of the reasons why they can be hard to fish because the fish are on the invertebrates and you need to get them onto your angler's bait. But yet, they, as I say, I've sometimes say to my friends in the north or whatever and they complain about weed and earlets, I say, you haven't seen weed. (laughs) You want to see a gravel pit in the middle of summer, a rich gravel pit, you will be gobsmacked how much weed and whatever there's in it. They can't not help keep the weed growth down by clouding the water, limiting light penetration. I just don't think there's enough of them in these sort of waters. Like as I say, like like a a hundred acre lake or whatever could hold a potentially huge natural population of fish. You, You always talk about natural lakes like around about 300 pounds an acre or something like that so multiply that by 100 and you're going to get oh well I think that's 30,000 pounds or something like that you know like 15 tons of fish but no it, it's the nature of the bottom as well with the gravel I think if you have like a, a brick pit or something like that or a muddy bottom lake then they're going to be able to root in around but I think in gravel pits, they probably graze more, and I say they're going for the invertebrates in the weed rather than bloodworm in the silt, if you see what I mean. The things may change eventually on some of them as silt builds up because they are new new lakes or whatever, but you obviously will get some colour in the summer. They, they, you, you will get things like blue-green algae and things in them. They can suffer from whatever causes in the first place, you know, like the nitrates and things like that, where you can get leakage off the land. In the south and southeast of England, you can get very, very hot summers that get that sort of growth going. But coloured water, no, you'd have to really heavily stock a bit to be like after be a commercial fishery gravel pit to get that. Something else adding to the popularity of gravel pit fishing is the fact that the records for species like Bream and Tench have jumped up by a good 50% since the 1970s, in no small part due to the productivity of these gravel pits. Well, it has to be the nature of the gravel pit itself. People talk about global warming now for at least 15, 20 years or something like that. And certainly when I was living in the south of England, I noticed that some winters you never even got a winter, it seemed. And obviously the springs and the autumns are, are warmer as well. Like in the summer, everything's warm anyway, but... I bet there's a a much longer period for them to feed and so on. Obviously, you do get anglers bait, but it seems to me that the size of some of these pits, the the anglers bait is just going to be a drop in the ocean. It's more like the quality of the water. Often, the fish may have been the first ones introduced in, so they will grow big as well because they've got the lack of competition as well. As I say, the invertebrates that you tend to get them as well. And the one thing you can say is that for any given locality in the country, it seems that if you've got gravel pits, there, that is where you will get the local specimen fish. They may not be necessarily as big as the fish in the southeast of England because it's not as warm. But if you wanted to catch a, a tenery, maybe even an 11 pound tench in the northwest, you would aim for that sort of thing or you know or sort of a, a mere you think about the cheshire mirrors which never fish them but they sound to me as if they were rich shallow weedy waters you know with relatively low stock densities and the fish got the chance to grow grow really big and if you see a mature gravel pit it is a beautiful lake there's no two ways about it what about the downside one which immediately springs to mind is trees on islands for cormorants to safely perch or roost in Yes, I suppose that that is the one downside in that they've turned out to be very good for the bottom feeding fish, the carp and the tench and the bream. They're the ones where the records of, as I say, like 
people can catch fish that they could have only dreamed of catching 20, 30 years ago, and widespread as well, If you once you can get to grips with them. But, of course, you have had cormorants and so on moving inland, probably as a result of the common fisheries policy, just because they can't catch the small fish they want at the sea. So what that tends to mean is that the more silverfish species, such as perch and roach and so on, which will probably have been stocked because most of the sort of like, if you took the angling subsidiaries which I mentioned earlier, they're going to put in the main species. You're not going to tend to get them stocking too much with say, crucian carp or rudd or something like that. They will put the main ones in. But the cormorants, because you will often get islands out in the middle of these lakes, they can find places to roost and so on. And so the ones that I fished you might have a small head of roach and perch or what in them, but they weren't prolific just because you had the cormorants on them all the time. So we've looked at gravel pits so far as a generic concept. Can we now start fleshing out the bones a little more by naming names? Where and which are the best gravel pits in the country, either for general mixed specimen hunting and or for targeting specific species, and in particular, big bream and big tench? Well... As I said earlier on, even if you don't want to be travelling miles, within your own locality, I would say that if you do have gravel pits, they will produce the locally the biggest specimen fish. They can be all around the country, but they do seem to be like, it's the river valleys and often the main river valleys. And as I say, off the top of my head, I would be talking sort of for Midlands, you'd be thinking Trent Valley, East Anglia, you'd be thinking the Wensum. Down south, you're thinking basically the Thames and its tributaries. That's where you've got them. And obviously it is warmer down in the southeast, especially around the London area. It does seem that sometimes there's like differences in the valleys or whatever. For example, I used to fish in the Lee Valley, which just ran directly north of London. And I would say recommend any of the pits there. You would, have, for example, have a chance of a really big tension. The record tench is actually a huge fish. It is one of the exceptional records on the books, really. But in terms of, say, catching and trying to catch a 10, 11, 12 pound tench, that would be as good a bet as any. But funnily enough, in terms of carp, for example, the British record carp is about 66, 67 pound, and yet the Lee records seem to be round about 50 pound. For some reason or other, the carp in the Lee pits didn't seem to grow quite as big as other areas in the south for, for whatever reason so there may be local factors at play but yes the Thames Valley pits like obviously these days for carping a lot of it is syndicate waters and paying several hundred pound a year and things like that but from attention bream fishing there will be plenty of club waters it's, it's a shame what happened with CMEX because they decided to give it up at one point or other you could buy individual ticket waters but you could buy cover all ticket and you if you wanted to do it you would have had access to as well as river stretches 60 or 70 gravel pits with massive fish of all species but they started converting some to syndicates and then finally they've given it up but as i said for locally it's a good or better as any if you do get the chance well anywhere in the southeast is fine Tell us a bit more now about your own personal experiences. Well, I was just a very local angler. I, in some ways, I missed out, whatever. For example, I knew at one point about Great Perch out of the Grey Twos, which was probably about 60, 70 miles drive from me, but I never tried it, for example. I just didn't fish locally. But as I say, in the Lee Valley, which I fished, there was a number of pits. In fact, there was, in some ways, there was too much water and that was even despite some of them being set aside for bird watches and things like that. At the time, there was more water than land, actually. But ultimately, I I did most of it out of two pits, basically. There was a third one, and, and the two pits I fished, they were actually two pits connected together. They had different names. Well, certainly one of them had two different names. But yes, it was just like concentrating locally. And then the big thing was when we were allowed to start fishing in the old close season, which sort of, that was from 1995 onwards. Now, the interesting thing is, like, when I first moved south, and this kind of shows what's happened in the south, is that at that stage I'd never even had a five-pound tench, and it took me a couple of years before I caught one out of this pit that I went round. But I say, ultimately, I had an 11.5-pounder out of it, and a 10-pounder as well, 
and a ten pounder out of this other lake that I fished as well. And I had good numbers of eight and nine pound fish. Now you never catch loads because tench aren't that sort of species. They seem to go around in smaller family groups. If I got six or seven once or twice a season, I was pretty pleased with that. And that's even with night fishing. Like I had the odd better catch. I remember once having 15 one night, night and following morning, and I got five more the following. That was the most I ever got. But one or two catches where I had 9, 10, 11, that sort of style. But yes, it was the quality of the fish and the big average size. And then that was on the change. The bream, though, was a different thing entirely. I probably didn't actually fish the best chance for the bream lakes. I actually ended up ultimately fishing reservoirs at Walthamstow in North London. And I sort of like double the number of double figure bream I'd caught over the previous 10, 15 years in about, well, probably less than a year, actually. It was like, I think the second time I fished, I caught seven double figure fish in a day. But that was like, that lake was something else, but it was more down to the, the number of fish in the lake. But if it was a lake with a relatively small number of bream in, it was hard going. It would, uh, they, they drive you to distraction in some ways. You get them round and you might get the odd gentle sort of bite and liners and you might get one chance of a proper bite or something like that it was uh yes as i say i thought at the time i thought if you can catch bream out of a gravel pit you can definitely call yourself a fisherman anyone listening to that cannot fail to have been impressed so much so perhaps that as a result they do a bit of research and head off tackle at the ready to start looking up those big bream and big tench but unfortunately it isn't always as simple as that some of these waters, for example, can be as much as a hundred acres in size. Eventually, by trial and error, and after much potential frustration, they could well start to reap some rewards. So let's talk watercraft now, and making the right decisions with regard to catching bream and tench. They're certainly different. I can talk more about tench in that actually, funnily enough for bream, they tend to sort of stay to round about the same spot. They're like open water to bream. And of course, this is where it gets really hard, because if you're just faced with a big open gravel pit, oh my God, where do I start? This is where, for the bream, doing the research probably helps, talking to other anglers, maybe talking to carp anglers, that sort of thing. If I was looking for somewhere which would make sense, would be kind of where it maybe just opens out a bit, if you see what I mean, where you might have a channel that opens out into a bay or where there's a peninsula and you've kind of got bays, you can just imagine them going in front of it or something like that. But it would be a bit of a, a long slog. You'd you'd almost have to go back to, potentially almost go back to Irish things. I used to go like bream fishing in Ireland and we'd go fish spotting and things, looking for rolling fish and whatever. So in some ways it may be for bream because they tend to stay to parts of it. like they obviously have patrol routes as well and I think they will follow the wind to some extent but certainly not like carp time by the water's edge is probably as good or better as any and I suppose this is one thing where I sort of failed in that I tend to often fish only one night whereas really to get the most out of bream fishing you probably need to fish two or even three nights actually whereas tench what you have to forget about is you, people think about classic tench lakes and if they, they imagine tench are a kind of um, a fish that doesn't move about much, a bit lethargic, all the rest of it, fishing by the lily pads and whatever. But this isn't true at all, certainly not in gravel pits. They get about the place. They move around quite a lot, actually. So what I would say you look for, like obviously you should never ignore the near side margin for tench because that's obviously a feature and anything like where you've got a margin, such as an island or a bar or something like that. Like I tend to fish on the bottom of a bar or something like that as opposed to the top. I'll come to that in a bit, I guess. But where there's channels and things, like channels between islands, channels between bars, that sort of thing. As I said, they, they will move around a lot more than what people think. And I've even come across it in other lakes. I've caught attention at one end of a brick pit three days after I caught it at the other end of a brick pit, for example. So they get about a lot more than what people think. Depth-wise, bream don't mind deep water at all. And potentially the deeper the better. I wouldn't be too much if I was fishing in the mid-teens for, for bream. Certainly in Ireland, it made no difference whatsoever. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't mind fishing in 20 foot of water. 
tench, shallower water, just a few feet deep, four or five, six foot. I wouldn't really want to look for deeper than that. But yes, it's just looking for um, sort of, as I say, places where they can move through and where you can sort of ambush them and where there's a couple of possibilities to peg. I wouldn't really want to fish where it's just completely open. The other thing as well that I found, and some, I once read it somewhere, and I thought, oh, that's true, actually. And yet again, it goes back to the lethargic, people thinking they're lethargic, and that is avoid corners of lakes and things like that. People think, oh, they might just be in the corner. But because they move around, you're far better in a slightly more open sort of spot. They may just not come visiting that corner very much. You might just end up stuck in somewhere because they're not living there. They're moving around the pit. You will get some mixing up. You will catch tench where you catch bream, potentially. But in some ways, it's a never the twain shall meet. It's like, we're, as I say, channels, margins, bars, that sort of thing. That's what I'd be looking for for tench. You mentioned bars and features. How would you go about finding these? And does the bottom substrate make any difference either? Well, funnily enough, actually finding them, there is a little bit of technology. You can actually even use Google Earth to um, look for bars and so on. Like, they'll not be far below the surface, but as I say, if it's been done on a nice sunny sort of day, that could often give you a bit of a help on starting on these things. The other classic way, obviously, is to use a marker float, like marker float to the end of your line and a heavy lead and just feel for the bars but to get that effect to you pull them up over the bars and so on. So say I used to like fishing at the bottom of bars where you can sort of just get that general bed of bait and somewhere for them to settle onto. And as regards to sort of bottom, well, you definitely want a clean bottom, certainly for bream. Tenture okay, a little bit of silt weed, that's fine. But the one thing you definitely don't want is blanket weed or the sort of stuff when you're dragging and it's black and horrible and stinking. That is a killer even for tench. If you're on the boilies, a fish might dig into it. But as I say, if you find that, I'd say try somewhere else. And of course, there are also steps you can take to attract and accumulate fish in your chosen peg. Well, the one thing about gravel pits is they are big lakes and very often they are underfished. And it depends obviously where it is in relation to where you live, but... I would certainly think about pre-baiting as a, a good possibility. We used to do it in Ireland. It was a very good way of gathering fish quickly. Like if we went to Ireland, if we didn't pre-bait a peg, and it was a good peg, you'd catch some fish the following day, maybe 20, 30 pound of them. And then you'd chuck more bait in, and the following day, you might get your 100 pound bag, which was the aim of going to Ireland. If you actually pre-baited though, you didn't get the first day. You got day two straight away. You'd, you'd get your 100 pound straight away. So if you do get the chance, pre-baiting would be a good thing, certainly for tench, because you could pop down the night before, pre-bait a peg. If they have found it and they're there, they will be there straight away. And then, well, you can take it from there, you either fish it. If you don't catch and they're not there, well, you can then try another peg or something like that. It just doubles your chances. As regards bream, though, it's more about their habits, because bream... Generally speaking, it's fishing at night. You might catch them during the day, early sort of April time or something like that. But once the weather settles into May, you are night fishing. And really, you might as well be there piling the bait in. And then it seems that on a lot of pits, which I never did, is you need to be giving it like two or even three nights. It's like night three is the one where you might really bag up. Night one, you're just looking for fish in the, in the peg. You know, even if you don't catch any, just some sort of sign or whatever. It, it's probably a sort of thing where if there's two or three of you and you can cover the lake and swap notes and whatever, it's, that's, that's where as a lone angler, it probably gets quite tricky. Whereas with tench, it is possible to read the lake a lot more and identify possible candidates. Tell us a bit more now regarding the types and amounts of loose feed used. Obviously, with bream, anybody that knows about bream fishing, the sky can be the limit because they're in great big shoals. We're in Ireland, well, we pre-bait nowhere near as heavily as some people. We used to use like 40 or 50 balls of ground bait for the following day and a couple of pints of maggots, castor, corn, whatever, you know, just to get them to settle onto it. As I say, when you're faced with a great big pit, you could put in vast quantities if you really wanted. For tench, you, because you're not likely to be catching as many, you can cut back a bit. But I, 
I always used to think in terms, if I went for a night, so I went down the previous evening and fished through till just gone lunchtime the following day, I'd be thinking four or five pound of ground bait all told, two or three pints of maggots maybe, because I was a maggot fisherman essentially, corn, hemp or whatever, lots of particles. They love browsing over a bed of bait. If you ever see an underwater video, you actually see the tench settling in the peg and you're fishing away. And yet they're, they're there around right all the time. You're just waiting for one of them to sort of make a mistake. In fact, I actually once had a very interesting experience on an Irish lake, actually, and it was like crystal clear. It had a white bottom due to the, I don't know, presumably water snails or something that died off. It was The lake was called Finn Lake, and Finn in Irish meant white, and because it, it had a white bottom. So you were fishing in three or four foot of water on the float, and like using ground bait for tension so put a few small balls of ground bait in and just like loose feed maggots over the top before you know it you saw the tench coming into the peg and before you know it they were milling around exactly like in an underwater video and well actually i could have caught more fish because i was so interested in watching the fish as opposed to watching the float but that morning i actually caught nine tens they're all about three pound a piece but the pattern was it was classic tench fishing that the fish were there and of course once you were there you realize well why am i chucking bait on top of them because they're not moving anywhere they'd sort of disappear off for a bit and then they come back and as the morning went on the gap got bigger and bigger and then finally around about one o'clock that was it they, they'd gone for the day now gravel pits are different in that they take time to warm up and actually round about dinner time and even into the afternoon can often be the, the best time, even later in the year when the weather's settled, like obviously early spring, as the water's warming up, you can catch it any time of the day and often late afternoon might be the best time. It's different than when before there was no close season. And the catch pattern was the same as well. You never get tench one after another. You tend to catch one and then get a gap. You catch, then you might get two fairly quickly and then you might get a longer gap. But actually all the time the fish were kind of there. It was really fascinating stuff, so it made me think, I'm, I'm, I'm putting too much bait in in some ways, but as I say, when you're faced with a big pit, you just keep putting it in, and it seems to work anyway, but yeah, potential nice bed of particles, ground bait, whatever, that they can kind of settle on, and you can then sort of fish over is what you're looking for, and just keep topping it up bit by bit. Pre-feeding can be a costly business. So do you not run the risk of being watched and possibly having someone move in and steal your investment? Well, I think that's a case of choosing your pit and your and where you're going to pre-bait, obviously. Let's say you pre-bait overnight for tench. You're going to go down in the evening, you're going to chuck it in, and then you're going to go back fairly early in the morning. The chance of somebody actually, because a lot of these pits are, are underfished, the chance of somebody being there is pretty small. Really. You could even leave a note, you know. And if somebody sees it, whatever we used to do it in Ireland, they don't, don't we? Well, the, all the time we ever pre bait in Ireland, there was never anybody there the following morning or anything like that. Like I say, on gravel pits, you don't actually have to be there at the crack of dawn. You know, like the classic tench fisher's dawn of getting up at three or four in the morning. Don't bother. Turn up about seven o'clock in the morning or something. Get fishing for about that sort of time or something. And fish through the warmth of the day. Albeit that when you do night fish, you'd often find first light could be good it, it sort of when you were tench fishing overnight it was more like you were aiming to catch the, the morning after the night before you're trying to get the fish to settle on your bait overnight and you might catch the odd odd fish in the night you might even catch in the previous evening it all depended on the temperature if it was too cold you wouldn't catch if it was too blisteringly hot you wouldn't catch but if it was that nice lovely warm evening you could catch in the evening as well so pre-baiting if you're confident nobody's going to give it a go and say it, it, it may be just a way of speeding things up especially if you're trying to learn somewhere it might give you two shots at it basically but for bream as i say it is night fishing you if you're fishing april time you can pre-bait and fish during the day because that's essentially the sort of thing we used to do in ireland we never didn't night fish we just used to uh, sort of fish during the day like start fishing about nine in the morning or even a bit later actually like fish through till four or five o'clock and go back for a tea or something like that but as I said, once it seems to settle, I think you might as well be at the lake and watch for things happening and then just, well, if you happen to see fish elsewhere, move on to them or something like that. You know, don't, don't flog a dead horse. Is there anything to be gained from, say, pitching a bivvy, whether you stay in it or not, just to state your claim? 
well, if it's just staking a claim, I won't bother. I'd just write a postcard out or whatever and stick a bank stick through it. He's <laughs> doing, doing Ireland or whatever, as I say. But whether people will be observant enough to notice it or something, I, I don't know really. I suppose these days people just go bivying up anywhere. They'd say, well, why bother pre-baiting it? If I'm going to pre-bait this, but I might as well fish it overnight. The only thing is, the following morning, you're not as fresh as what you'd be and will you be able to fish it properly to find out what's going on and sometimes when I used to bivy up I'd actually I'd learned the fish movement like one of the spots I fished there was I was fishing on a peninsula but there's a bay sort of behind me and I knew the fish were there during the day and what I'd do is I'd be fishing my night spot where they kind of converge and I was hoping to make them settle on there come the following morning and hopefully get a big catch but what I'd also do just before it went dark I'd go and chuck 10 to 12 balls of ground bait into this bay and then if they hadn't seen these settled and wasn't doing anything in the morning I'd go around there about 8, 9 o'clock with feeder rod or something like that and I'd often nick out a fish or two so I'd essentially pre-baited that anyway but as I say with people bivvying up these days they'd, they'd do it anyway it's how much you want to try to fish actively rather than leaving the rods to fish themselves and, and I personally would always prefer to fish actively and keep the bait going in and the feeder or something so you've got the chance for them to sort of like find a bit more bait or something like that so that's why i sometimes pre-baited and then went when slept in my bed at home basically right so we've decided on a lake to fish we've found a likely looking peg and pumped in the requisite volumes of feed but we still have to catch the fish success unfortunately isn't a foregone conclusion so tactically how do we go about getting these fish out well, these days, I suppose most people bought rig fishing. As I say, when you're fishing at night, well, obviously you are sleeping, actually. You're not actually sat by the rods or anything like that. So you, you tend to fish with these efficient boat rigs. And to be honest, they are very efficient. And even for stream or something like that, most people seem to use leads. But I just, I, I always think, well, why not use a feeder? I just use a big feeder. So I've got a little bit of extra bait as well. They tend to use PVA bags and things. But that can also limit you to what, you, what you're feeding in your PVA bag as well, albeit that bream absolutely love pellets and things like that as well. They, they love fish meal, actually. Uh, they'll tench love it as well, actually, but tench are a bit more... Well, they've both got very wide-ranging things. But, yeah, I always say, well, let's just put it... Rather than messing about with PVA bags, I'd just put a great big feeder on, and it's like be a ground bait feeder. Though sometimes, if I knew there was plenty of tench about, I'd use a block end full of maggots as well, because tench absolutely love maggots. So I would do that, and then I'd fish what they call a helicopter rig, which is sort of, but just with a short tail, like a six-inch tail from the tip of my ring finger to like the base of the wrist. Any shorter, you'd sometimes get a take, and as you lifted in, you'd only ever hook fish in the front of the lips, and occasionally you'd lift into one, it'd come out, but just give that extra inch or two, and it seemed to work very well. But the other thing I like to do, and I say I'm more of an active fisherman, I would often, I'd often fish like, a lot of people like to fish two or if you've got an extra rod license, three parts of a peg. And I certainly wouldn't mind dropping a bait in the margin. But certainly for bream and even for tents, I actually like fishing two rods in the same spot, two feeders. And I'd have one on the boat rig for the efficiency. And the other I'd actually just fish on a, a standard paternoster rig like we used to use in Ireland. So you'd have a, an open end feeder on a paternoster. You'd have quite a long tail. Like I used to find with tench that give them about three foot of rope. Like with bream, it was even longer. Like our bream fishing, we kind of learned sort of from reading articles from people fishing the fens or whatever, you know, like Ivan Marks on the Grey Twos. And they used to give them like four or five foot tails and give them enough rope and they'd hang themselves and it definitely worked. But for tench, yes, I'd fish a, a paternoster, feed on a paternoster, a three foot tail, and have quite a long drop because tench, they give you good bites. People might think they give you delicate bites because, yet again, they think about people fishing next to lily pads, but you fish on the tip. It'll wang your bobbin up. Like I actually used to use plastic bottle tops, actually, for <laughs> is indicated really old school as opposed to uh, sort of fancier, heavier sort of ones. But yeah, by having the two rods side by side, the two baits going in, and I could gauge on one. And you might miss bites on the running rig, but at least you felt what was going on besides. And I say sometimes you'd fish two parts of the peg, and but it didn't seem a good idea to have bits here and there. You were best trying to. Um, concentrate the fish on the, the one bit where you thought was going to be the main spot where you're going to catch them. How long might you leave an individual bait in the water 
and how long would you keep putting baits out before thinking that perhaps you might be in a bad spot? I think the thing about Tench and Bream is they both show themselves. Like Bream are famous for rolling, but Tench roll a lot, actually, as well. Though it doesn't necessarily... You'd normally get Bream rolling on where they live. That's where you're going to fish to catch them. Like, you can get patrol routes. I know one of the lakes I fished, and it happened with the Tench as well. They used to go to an underwater island in the middle of the night, and that was the peg to fish at night. And you used to see fish rolling, but actually they were ready to feed, but they were actually moving to this underwater island. But normally, bream roll where they are, and that's where you fish. Whereas tench roll in the general area, you might get one bang on where you're fishing, but you might get one 15, 20, 30 yard away, but give it a chance to find it. But that's why I like to cast in, because you've got that little bait to put it to home in. And as I say, I found that one time I fished in Ireland, that clear water lake, it was a shallow lake. Where did they come from? God knows. But they found it. They found it before you knew it. It's like, I remember once sort of going to a, a chat by a, a barbel expert, a guy called um, Fred Crouch. He'd caught like 10,000 barbel. And he was saying, fish are just like birds, basically. You know, like, feed your birds in your lawn or whatever. You know, nothing's like, but before you know it, they found it. How on earth did they spot it? And it's that sort of thing. So, yeah, they will give the presents away. So how long do you leave your baits in the water and stick with a particular peg? Well, as I say, you get the chance of um, seeing the fish roll rolling. And if you see them rolling, well, then you're going to stick with it. If you're actually seeing absolutely no sign of anything, then right, OK, what do we do now? If I could, if I was day fishing, I used to like to actively fish or whatever. And I'd certainly like casting every half an hour or something like that. I, even when I used to night fish, I'd wake up every hour and a half and have a a recast then actually funnily enough you're kind of on edge all the time sort of stuff but then I suppose that's just the sort of person you are and okay you're also worried about your bait and, and all the rest of it albeit that people fish with dead maggots and well actually they fish with artificials these days like a, a great little tip is to fish a couple of artificial maggots because you kind of got the extra flotation and then you've got a sort of a couple of either live ones as well or dead, and you just get a more neutral buoyance hook or whatever and that seemed to be an edge that sort of worked anyway it certainly wasn't doing any harm but if you were tench fishing let's say you're going for two nights if you'd not done anything on the first night well you might catch on the next night but you were you weren't flogging a dead horse some of these lakes were really hard and you, you may be just fishing for well one more the phrase was a fish a day you know and it might be you get nothing on night one and two on night two so you could get that sort of thing happening but you would have normally had some sort of clue that was there if it was as dead as anything well, of course, the question then is, do you want to like move your bivvy and all the rest of it? Is it down to the conditions? Like, if it's horrible conditions, if it's a cold northeasterly in springtime, you've not to expect to do too much. Bream, though, that would be a harder sort of thing. That's where you've got to, I think, the confidence will come in, knowing that my bait's out there and I'm just going to keep it and I'm in the right spot and I'm not going to panic. Because, as I say, like when I used to bream fish at night... It'd be like the first part of the night. You kind of you knew your fate in that two-hour spell between it going dark and let's say in the springtime up to about midnight. You weren't going to start catching bream at three or four in the morning. You kind of knew what you were going to do then, and of course, then you kind of knew you were having to wait till the same time the following day. And it's a long old day when it's like that. So yeah, it's uh, it's your confidence with it. As I say, I think for bream fishing in gravel pits. You need to find one that's got a lot of fish in them. If you can find the ones that have big numbers of bream, which aren't that many, because obviously you're getting more and more carp these days, taking up the biomass and all the rest of it, that will give you far more chance. If, if there's not a huge population of bream, but they're there, that's when it can get frustrating because you just get the odd chance, sort of one or possibly two chances every 24 hours, which is hard going when you think about it. Would it be too expensive to go in for multi-swim baiting, then roll between the two? Or might that perhaps even split fish numbers up, rather than concentrating them? That's not the sort of thing you could do for bream anyway. I think you set your stall for the peg and that's it. If you were first fishing in a gravel pit for the tench, to pre-bait two, I wouldn't go more than two. You're just trying to find what might be a good peg. I wouldn't necessarily make it recommend roving for gravel pit tench but it was interesting that it worked if you see what i mean and then it's down to your pocket if i was pre-baiting though for tench i'd be thinking 
no more than 15 to 20 balls of ground bait. So you're talking four or five pound weight of ground bait top like, and then you might be talking cheap particles like hemp, corn, pellets, and you'd probably tend to include maggots as well. They're going to home in on it anyway, so it's down to your depth of your pocket. But it did save time because, as I say, when you did night fish, the, your really good nights were, were the morning after the night before when they'd settled on it, and that by pre-baiting, you're kind of replicating that effect. Whereas if you're fishing a hard lake, just to turn up would be very difficult. It was actually very interesting. The, one, the lake where I got the 11.5 pounder, like the 10 pounder as well, it was a great big lake. It was actually two lakes connected together. And one of them was actually called 70 acres, even though it was, like, it was probably a little bit smaller, like it had been backfilled. But it was probably getting on for 100 acres between the two. But the hot spot was the channel that connected the two lakes, and there was a bridge over, but there was like the four corners of either side of the channel. And it was close to the car park, and there was one or two other swims as well, with boys and whatever, that fish well. But as the close season went on, or the, uh, what was the close season, it seemed all the fish seemed to congregate on that spot, and by the time we got to the end of May, anybody fishing any other part of the lake wasn't catching anything. They'd all kind of just honed in on this little bit, and that's so... So yeah, they, yeah. as I say, this one that I caught, it was caught by lots of people, actually. It was <laughs> I caught it early May when it was quite small, believe it or not, but it spread its favours around a bit, that one. As I say, whether other tench caught quite as much as it, I don't know. But yeah keeping the bait going in, if you've got the time to be able to sit on the peg, like that lake, you get the odd person fished it for a week and they might catch 20 odd out of it, like only like three or four a day, but, but so they still piled up the fish, but yeah. What about hand tackle and bank equipment choices? Well, for rods, I used to fish pound and a quarter test curve. They're certainly stronger than normal flow rods. I also used to fish rods like a method feeder rod or... It would be like these days you can get twin tip rods where you've got an Avon top and you've got a quiver tip top. And if you had a powerful twin top rod, I would often fish with the quiver tip or something like that. But yeah, typically it would be more of a specialised tench float rod, pound and a quarter test curve and a method feeder rod because you're chucking a big feeder. For tench, you're obviously not necessarily chucking very far. Like bream, you may need to go distance but it's, it's down to your capability i wouldn't recommend trying to fish the distance carp anglers fish if you think you can great but if you can find some relatively deepish water fairly close in you should be able to fish at 20 to 30 yard range i would hope tench though no you're not you shouldn't be going that and as i say you're trying to fish accurately anyway but yeah pound and a quarter test curve rod reels just good fixed spool reels like with a bait runner Line strength, I used to fish around about eight pound. Some people might have fished, used to fish a bit lighter, but at a certain point, I've got to go heavier. Some people might fish slightly stronger. Certainly use fluorocarbon line in the clear water that you get in gravel pits. The business end, as I say, I used to use a simple helicopter rig with a feeder at the end or a, a running, like a paternostered feeder, and you get good bites on that. Bite alarms. Some people like to fish with a slight bit of slack in the system, but I used to fish with a very tight line because I didn't want to be woken up in the night by beeps. I just wanted a, a run, basically, if I was to be woken up. So I would fish with the line tight and a very light indicator, like a, a washing-up bottle top. And if you've got a take, actually, what happened is it, if it, during the day you'd see it bouncing the rings, and if you've actually ever seen an underwater video, you'll actually see when a tench picks it up, he picks the bait up or even a cock and they shake the head and they haven't yet kind of fully hooked themselves. And what happens is when the bait runner goes and you get that give, that's what kind of sets the hook and the fish panics and goes in the opposite direction. That's what really hooks them. But if you get your indicator bouncing during the day, you can just lift in and you've got the fish. It's just not ran off at that point. But yes, I used to fish the bite alarms. I actually used to fish with the most sensitive ones I could get so that even the slightest beep registered funnily enough despite the bobbing thing it was like when i was fishing in there i wanted to know exactly what was going on so i used to use optonics but i used to have a twitcher wheel in them and like the, the wheel would spin around and it could go from seeing the, the vein of the wheel to not seeing it and very little movement would show up as an indication so when you got to run any sort of bite it was just like a continuous sort of thing and the other ones you used were delkin they were very sensitive as well 
yeah, I think that was about it. Like I say, you want to be in a good bed chair or whatever. You've got to make yourself comfortable, otherwise it can be a shattering experience. Um, a good brew in the morning sort of style. Take some bacon, some bacon butter. But yes, as I say, it's like a lot of fishing. It's just like locating the fish and fish with a good method and good conditions. And hopefully it will take care of itself. And what about hooks and her rigs? Well, I just used to use a fairly normal size 8 hook, like a fairly strong one, sometimes barbed, sometimes barbless. I was to say I was a maggot fisherman, so I didn't used to bother with her rigs. I did occasionally used to fish small boilies like the start of the season, like 10 millimeter boilies. And they're, yeah, just a simple her rig next to the hook and just 8 or 9 inch length basically, and that was it. But yeah, just very straightforward stuff really. Something I have a particular interest in is keep nets. Do you use them? And if so, have you ever considered the potential risk these pose to fish? It's interesting on the keep net front because, as I say, we used to go to Ireland and we would go back to the same spots year in, year out. We kind of found where they lived. And, of course, that's the sort of thing you're looking for on the gravel pits with the bream. As I said, they tend to get about the place a bit. But, obviously, you're still looking for the same sort of general area and some pegs are better than others. There's, there's no two ways about it. But... Yeah, we go back to the same spot year in, year out, and we'd always catch. But if we caught, we bagged up like £100 plus, and we put the fish back, if we went back the four or five days later, it never used to do anything. So I think it had actually shocked them. It might not have killed them, because obviously you get a lot of fish, get repeat captures, like that tench I was mentioning before. It used to be caught several times every close season, as everybody fished the same spot, and it, it kept coming out. But... It obviously wasn't doing them a lot of good, but of course these days a lot of people just don't do it. You see, you see the odd person, for example, on the ribble if they're silverfish fishing, but nine out of ten people put them back anyway. Like I, I used to carry a keep net with me when I was down there, but it was only in case I caught a real monster. Like I've never really keep a bream in a keep net of any sort of size, and certainly sacks you wouldn't touch them, keeping them upright and all the rest of it and so on. I've got an awful lot of photographs of fish just lying on the bank, basically, where I've just put the scales alongside them for whatever, and then just put them back. But one of the double-figure fish I caught was that mid-morning, so that was okay, just keep them landing it. But the other two, I think the only two occasions I ever used the keep net is when I caught them, and it, like, one was in the middle of the night, and the other was like four or five in the morning, first light, and it was like, well, I want this for the record, and I had a single fish in a big Irish keep net, and I think that was perfectly fine. But yeah, I think... The experience of Ireland of cramming fish in a keep net is not good for them anyway. Recently, I read a report suggesting that if you want to catch a British record for most coarse fish species these days, or a specimen representative of that record, you now need to fish with high-protein baits. Not only that, it also claimed that as most users of these baits tend to fish them on self-hooking boat rigs, not only was the art of fishing other baits being lost as a result, but also the old and arguably more skillful techniques that went with them, and as a result, a good proportion of coarse anglers were developing into unskilled specimen hunters with a high threshold of boredom, willing to wait for as long as it takes to catch that one special fish. Well, there's potentially something in it, but of course, if you are bivvying up, you are tired. I know from doing it to try to start fishing actively and properly the following day, is not necessarily the easiest sort of thing to do. And it is a very efficient method. I, I know when I started using it and started fishing these lakes where you did have great big fish in it, if you missed the bite, you got a bit of a drop run or something like that, you kind of thought, that was an eight or nine pound tench I've just missed. And I'm sure that's why the rise of these and her rigs and so on, people have realized they just need to be as efficient as possible. The people that just like cast out and they leave them, well, yes, you can say they're not fishing or whatever. Like I, I used to like to think, well, at least I'm fishing actively with one rod and the other one's my efficient one for I will nail fish on that one anyway. So it is a tricky sort of thing and it definitely does put fish on the bank. The high protein bait thing, well, that's an interesting one though, because even though I've caught a lot of big tench, like eight and nine pounders, when you think how many I've caught, and even though I've actually had three double-figure fish, I sometimes think I should have had one or two more. I think it's come across people catching loads of doubles, not for sure at certain, but I certainly seem to be able to catch more, probably because I fish more actively. I seem to catch more fish than other people, but in terms of 
the really big fish, they caught just as many, if not more, than me. And of course, they were often fishing boilers and things, so I was fishing maggots and so on. And there may be something in it, and even when I used to barbel fish on the lee, I remember one of the anglers there, and he's like, oh, we've been in the angling press quite a bit with some of his fish. And he says, oh, I always associate with you catching seven and eight pounders and things like that, you know. Well, <laughs> so it may be that my method, it may be also the fact that I just keep casting it. Certainly the barbel on the lee, you, you didn't want to be casting on them very often. But I think for in a big gravel pit, I'm sure that makes no difference whatsoever. And it is the dinner bell ringing. You know that from fishing on the ribble for the barbel and the chub there, you know, like you can chuck out there and catch first or second cast, chub and barbel, no problem, you know, in certain pegs, in with certain methods and so on. But it has kind of made me wonder. It happened on the other gravel pit I fished where there was, I say, I just caught one double. And the biggest fish, there was only just the odd one got to double figure fish. But for, say, for the amount I fished and the amount I caught... I would have hoped I would have caught one or two more, like not five or six or anything like that. So that high value, I wouldn't ignore it. As an on-course angler myself, to me, double-figure weights for bream and tench sound very impressive indeed. So with the right tactics and approach, how realistically achievable are those targets? Well, I think double-figure tench, if you're, if you're prepared to go for them and... Certainly if you're in the south of England, but it seems that like even, say, Norfolk pits and things like that, you know, that double-figure fish are on the cards. You probably need to find your waters. You need other anglers about, I think. You don't, you can't really do it all by yourself. Like, there was one pit down there, and it was like, one of these days I'm going to try it, and there was one or two big-name anglers have fished it, and it's a pit that has actually produced, I think it's the third biggest tench in the country. And there was one chap that's fished it, it's a well-known angler, and he's had two £11 tension a night. This is pretty good stuff, basically. But you sort of, I think, often to catch these other things, you need a few anglers about who you can swap tails with and things like that, and you sort of pull knowledge. Like obviously, some people won't, won't, won't give any information away at all, but you'll always find enough that will, between the two or three of you or whatever, you can get going. And then it's almost a numbers game. It doesn't seem to be much... As a, notwithstanding what you've just asked, so I've, it's just a case of catching fish, and the bigger ones will sort themselves out. Certainly that's when it comes to tench. You, you sort of, yeah, just to ask around locally, asking the local tackle shop or something, probably it's, that might be even better, better than the internet. Bream, you just need to find the lake, which has, say, got numbers of fish in. I think, I think that's the thing. You've got to try to find those pits that might have a, a big stock of them. And as I say, I went on to, Waltham Store Reservoirs, and this was after I'd been like bream fishing for that point, trying catching them for 10, 15 years, and I probably had about 10, 15 double figure fish. And yet, the second time I fished it, I think I had 17 bream and 160 odd pounds, seven doubles. It was pretty straightforward, like it, it was a big help that I'd done the island feeder fishing because at least I knew how to fish for bream, get the bed of bait, and I could catapult accurately. And it was just a case of stepped up Irish tactics at 50, 60 yard range with stronger lines, to cope with the casting. But it wasn't that difficult if, if you were on them and it was good green fishing conditions. That's one thing to mention that it'd be different at night on, on pits or whatever, but if you're fishing during the day, you want the classic wet, windy westerlies, all the Ws. That's what you're looking for for green fishing. Tense you like nice settled weather. You don't want to chill to the breeze or anything like that, but nice settled weather is what is, what is good for tension. As I say, on pits... You don't have to be there the crack of dawn. Sort of often the best time can be as it's warmed up around the middle of the day and into the afternoon. Like sometimes they can be like other lakes in that, yes, once you get to the afternoon, you've got to wait for the evening and so on. But there's enough of times when it'll fish during the day that, yes, you don't need to be at the crack of dawn. But yeah, I think from what I've seen, and when you look at the reports, even if you're just fishing locally, you will get your biggest chance of a specimen fish in a gravel pit, basically. And with regard to the records for both of those species, how tactically and where potentially do you think they will go? To be honest, it may be that, well, they could, they could be broken any day soon, though, albeit that the Tench record, I think, is a pretty special record because I've seen the pictures of it and it's like £15 odd and it's like a perfect Tench. Before that, a lot of the previous records, like £14, are really big fat fish full of spawn they may have had some sort of disease in their adropsy or something else as well they were quite gross fish this is a really exceptional fish and it, it does appear in recent years that there's not as 
many fish coming close to that as what they are. People still catch 12 to 13 pound tench every year. And as I said, one of the early questions asked is where it might be a good place to target. And I mentioned Lee Valley, but actually the other classic place is the Kent gravel pits. I can't remember exactly what part of Kent they're in. They're towards like the Medway Valley area, but maybe not as far as that Darren area. But there's like lakes like Johnson's and so on and the railway lake. They've always been big tench lakes. But as I said, the tench one's a little bit, maybe a bit out of reach, I would have guessed. And the bream one, well, that's got become colossal now. That's £22. And what's happened there is, is I think the lake it's come out is a place called Fendrayton. But it seems that there's actually literally one or two bream in it. And it's been caught by carp anglers. It gets caught about once every three years, it's bream by a carp angler. And... I believe some of all rounders are trying to catch it as well, but none of us managed so far. But obviously some of these carp lakes, which have big carp and which are being getting the bait piled in, they may be the ones for the giant bream. I think at, when you start talking £22 bream, and I'm thinking like 10, 11, 12 pound bream are big, that's in a different sort of league. So... I doubt that one's going to be broken anytime soon, but bream are a fish that, because of their nature, you don't necessarily catch them that much, if you see what I mean. So you can get surprises with them. And what do you think the general future of specimen bream and tench fishing might be, given that carp are becoming so popular these days? Well, I have to say I'm a little bit bothered about it in some ways, certainly from the bream fishing aspect, because as I say, you need gravel pits it's have a, a big population of them if you see what I mean and as I say carp just taking up more and more of the biomass and they're getting introduced into more and more places it may be that actually ultimately it could turn out to be reservoirs are the sort of place for the people that want to fish with the bream plus of course all rounders are becoming a bit of an endangered species these days you know there's like in generally the last couple of decades or so fishing's become carp and commercials and so the old school anglers are getting a little bit thinner on the ground and as I say as waters get a bit harder as well and so on and so forth but tench well we'll just have to see or whatever they are more of a niche fish but as I say with the carp taking up more of the biomass it, it may get a bit harder I have to say. And with you now re-established back up here in the northwest, looking more at barbel and chub these days are your bream and tench fishing days now over? I think my bivvy fishing days might be over, I have to say. It would be difficult to get back into it, having done what you've done. You'd obviously got to scale your expectations. It's down to the distance you prefer to travel, because I used to like just fishing locally in the Lee Valley, where it was only literally a few miles, and you felt comfortable. Whereas if I was here, around Preston, I feel I would have to go towards Cheshire Way, and you could fish mirrors and things like that, or there's sandy type mears as well. There's a place called, I think there's a place called Sandy Way or something, which is Warrington Anglers. Like, that sounds like that produces big fish. I think there's somewhere up near the M6, sort of uh, near Fortin Way, a bit past that. Or I think that's quite well known as well. It has big carp in it. They're potential candidates, but there's nothing that I know of that's really close at hand. And do I really want to be travelling 40, 50 miles or whatever to somewhere that I don't know and it's putting the campaign in as well. I think if there was two or three of you prepared to do it, you'd do it because then you could share things. It just makes life easy, but as a lone angler, it's not quite as simple as that. Clearly, from what Mike has been saying, not only is it possible to target bream and tench independently of species, but also being with a very good shot at isolating some of the bigger fish from the also rams. Tactics, obviously, will play their part. But so too, by the sounds of it, will investment in terms of loose feed, time, and where necessary, travel. Potential success, therefore, it seems, can be directly correlated to degree of desire to succeed. My thanks, then, to Mike Winrow for helping pointers in the right direction here.